I'm not sure what you say after that. Probably as little as possible. Uh, I was going to give you a plug for the football match, but I'll save that for the end, Emma. Um, uh, all I want to do uh, for now uh, is uh, to invite Emma Einson uh, to come and lead us in uh, a Bible study. Uh, Emma, we're so pleased that you're able to be with us uh, at, right at the beginning of a, t a new term and the academic year. Uh, it's very generous of you to give your time for this and so generous of Trinity Bristol to release their principle uh, at this point in the year. Uh, you were saying you've immersed yourself uh, in the love and truth of John's letters uh, for us. Uh, and we look forward to learning what it is that you've found in 1 John over this next session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. I think the phrase, follow that, is probably meant for this very moment. That was astounding, wasn't it? It was wonderful to hear that music together. What can follow that? Nothing apart from God's spirit continuing to work amongst us and to hover here with us as we open his word together. Thank you very much for the invitation to come and spend some time with you over these few days. It's wonderful to come and uh, be part of Leicester Diocese as you meet together. And thank you, I think, for the opportunity that's been given to me to delve into John's letters. Uh, it was suggested to me by the conference planning team that we look at 1, 2 and 3 John. So when it all goes wrong, which it's bound to, it's their fault, OK? Well, I didn't choose 1, 2 and 3 John. But actually, I'm really glad they did suggest 1, 2 and 3 John because these letters are an amazing insight into what it looks like to hold together in tension in the Christian community things that might appear to be opposites. They're not easy texts, as we shall see, but they are truly remarkable texts, not only for what they say about God and about his relationship with humans, but also for their relevance for our context today. As I've been uh, delving into the letters and reading them, it's as if they could have been written to our church today. They could have been written, I think, to Leicester Diocese or any diocese, especially a diocese in a time of transition, as we've already heard. I wonder if you have anyone here called Gaius? Nope. Or Demetrius, or Diotrephes? In fact, if you had someone called Diotrephes, Diotrephes would have made himself known to me already because he liked to put himself first, uh, but we'll hear more about that on Thursday. I don't know how well you feel you know the letters of John. They're very easy to find if you're struggling in your Bible. Just go to Revelation and turn left, and there they are. <laughs> and I would encourage you to read ahead, especially tomorrow and Thursday. Do read 2 and 3 John. They won't take you very long. Uh, read them ahead before we come together. You probably know John's letters better than you think you do. 1 John, which we're looking at today, contains a whole host of really familiar Bible verses. Ones like this, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. How about this, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Or this one, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice, or you probably know it as propitiation, for all our sins. You could join with me if you like. These are really familiar verses. We're used to them. They populate our liturgies. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. Very familiar. And 1 John is a really good place for any student of the New Testament to start. If we assume that the Apostle John wrote both John's Gospel and the letters of John, which we are going to do for the sake of today, there is some controversy about whether John the Elder and John the Apostle are the same person, but if you want to get into that debate, let's have dinner together and do it over dinner. But we're going to assume they're written by the, the same person. And in order to understand the Gospel, the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus, you have to understand the Gospel of John. 
And it's been said that in order to understand the Gospel of John, you need to understand the letters of John. In fact, Howard Marshall, in his commentary, suggests that in order to understand one John, you have to know two and three John, and then in order to understand the Gospel, you have to know one John. So the order really should be three, two, one, Gospel. But we're going to do it the other way around. One commentator says that one John is like a sermon with the Gospel of John as its text. So if the Gospel of John was written to explain the good news of Jesus to unbelievers and to lead to conversion, the letters of John are written to people who are already Christians to nurture and to encourage them. The key thing is that both the letter the letters and the gospel were written by someone who has first-hand experience of Jesus Christ. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we've heard, what we've seen with our eyes, what we've looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. None of us here has seen Jesus in the way that John had. But this immediacy of testimony challenges me to think again about what my testimony is today of Jesus, the word of life. So as a way of just encouraging each other as we open this letter together, just very briefly, I invite you to turn to the people around the table with you and say, where have you heard, seen, looked at or touched the word of life in recent days. This doesn't have to be a theological essay. It could just be a word, an instinct, a feeling. I think we could probably all say during that music, we saw, we heard, we sensed the word of life. But where where have you seen God? Where have you seen, touched, heard, sensed him? Just take a moment or two to talk to those on the table around you.
just a couple more moments for those conversations. Okay, if I could ask you to draw those conversations to a close. It's wonderful to see people speaking of God and what he's been doing in their lives. I'm going to give you more opportunities to talk together as we go on. And at the end of this time, I'm going to just unpack some of the themes of 1 John and then ask you to engage with me in an exercise and we'll see how that goes. The bits of paper on your tables are something to do with that. So more chance to discuss together as we go through this. So the letters of 1, 2, and 3 John were written by an apostle, someone like us with first-hand, well, someone who had more first-hand experience than we do of Jesus, probably written around AD 90. And these were the last texts in the canon of the New Testament to be written. So in a sense, they're effectively the last word of the apostles to the church. And John's letters, if you've read them, you will know, clearly contain a lot of theology but they are more than theological treaties. They are a warm and personal address by the elder to his dear children and his dear friends. These are probably the churches that John was associated with around Ephesus. And John's primary concern was to protect them from heresy. A situation had arisen in the churches involving false teachers. So he says in chapter 2, verse 26, I write these things to you concerning those who would deceive you. Elsewhere, he calls them false prophets, deceivers, and even antichrists. Strong words. I told you these letters were not going to be easy. When we hear antichrist, I wonder what we think of. Probably horror movies or dubious end-of-the-world predictions. When is the world meant to end? September the 23rd or something? That'll be fine. There's a whole lot of work I don't have to do if Jesus comes back then. <laughs> we might tend to think of demonic forces. 666. Actually, all antichrist means, literally, is the one who is antichrist. As John himself says, the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. He says that in verse, chapter 2, verse 22. If Jesus is the Messiah, literally the anointed one, an antichrist is simply the one who denies Jesus' messiahship. These are not demonic forces with red flashing eyes or making people's heads spin round or any of those things that we see in popular movies. But these were simply itinerant preachers who went round preaching a very subtly different gospel, close to Christianity in many respects, but a million miles away in others. They were probably Gnostics who were trying to make Christianity more intellectually acceptable. And their main contention was that the Son of God could not have been born in the flesh because bodies are nasty and sinful and true enlightenment comes from spiritual knowledge and that's something that only a few can achieve. Now, some in the church had fallen under the spell of this false teaching and had began to question whether they were Christians at all and what was needed for salvation. And the Gnostic heresies also led to some pretty bad behavior. The argument went like this. If spirit is good and physical matter is evil and salvation comes through enlightenment, then it doesn't really matter what you do with your body because it doesn't make a difference anyway. So it's all about the mind and the spirit and the body is secondary. So if you want to indulge in all manner of carnal lusts, then go right ahead. It won't affect your spiritual standing because that's all in the mind. And alongside that was the view that only a few could achieve this uh, place of enlightenment, only a few special ones. So there were two classes of Christian, those who had made it and those who hadn't. And it's into a church that had been influenced by these kind of thoughts that John writes his letters. And in doing so, I think he does three things primarily. One, he reasserts the orthodox belief about the nature of Jesus Christ and his coming in the flesh for the salvation of humankind. 
not a new idea, but a reaffirmation of the old commandment that you have had from the beginning. And it's summarized by this kind of verse. If this is love, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus was sent by God to die bodily, physically, on the cross. We're saved by water and by blood, by baptism and by the death of Jesus on the cross. And through that, we become children of God. So you are a child of God, John says to the church. That, says John, is the truth. The truth is a really important concept in the letters of John. The word truth comes 21 times in the three letters. Walk in the truth, know the truth, abide in the truth. But what John means here by truth is not simply a set of doctrines, although it does include doctrine. It's not simply a proposition. It's not simply intellectual assents. It's a lived experience. It's a way of life. And above all, it is relationship with the one who is the truth, Jesus Christ. And that leads to the second major theme of 1 John. Right doctrine, walking in the truth, leads to right living, walking in the light. And so John calls his readers back to repentance and holy living. My little children, he says, I'm writing these things to you so that you might not sin. Look, he says, if you really have Jesus Christ living in you, you can't go on sinning, lying, stealing, living in all sorts of wrong ways. We have to be honest about this, he says. If we have no sin, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us. He even goes as far as to say that those who have been born... Sorry, next one. Gone on too long. We'll come to that one in a moment. He even goes as far as to say that those who've been born of God do not sin because God abides in them. Now, you can imagine this has caused quite a bit of controversy over the years. What does it mean? It's in 3 9, if you want to look it up, to say those who have been born of God don't sin. Are you looking for it? Maybe I haven't got it up on the screen. You can find it. What does it mean? It doesn't mean that it's possible this side of heaven to achieve sinless perfection, although some have argued over the years that it is possible, particularly in the early holiness movements. After all, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So what does it mean to say that the one born of God doesn't go on sinning? Well, it means that those who belong to God shouldn't continue in rebellion against him. And what is the major sin that John is calling them to repent of? Not licentiousness or greed or drunkenness or sexual immorality, or those those might be included. The number one sin is, drum roll, lack of love. And that leads to John's third priority in writing his letters. John calls Christians to love each other. This is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has loved us. There's to be no hierarchy amongst you, he says, because all are children of God. All who have been anointed by the Holy One, and all of you have knowledge. There's no hierarchy of salvation in the kingdom. So the mark of a genuine Christian is that they love. Anyone can believe in God. Anyone can live well. But not everyone can love their brother or sister. And, he says, this love is to be shown not just in words or feelings, but in practical ways. Now, does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. So the one thing that will mark Christians out as different is our love shown in practical expressions. 
Tom Wright puts it like this, our love must come in the flesh as God's love did in Jesus. Why? Well, because we're family, aren't we? We're family, we're in it together. If we are children of God through the redeeming love of Christ, then we are brothers and sisters of each other. So I wonder if you'd like to turn to the person next to you and say, you are my brother or you are my sister. Greet those around you as a brother or sister in Christ. And so, Diocese of Leicester might be known for many things, but what John would say to us today is let's be known as brothers and sisters together. Aristides wrote to Hadrian in the second century about Christians, and he said this, they never fail to help widows. They save orphans from those who would hurt them. If they have something, they give freely to the man who has nothing. If they see a stranger, they take him home and um, this doesn't make sense, and happy although, as though he were a real brother. They don't consider themselves brothers in the usual sense, but brothers and sisters instead through the Spirit in God. Christians known for being brothers and sister to each other. So there we have the three themes in the book of 1 John. Know God, love, live well, and love each other. Now, John had been with Jesus in the very beginning, and perhaps now at the close of the first century, he was keen to recapture something of that vibrancy, that urgency, that freshness of encounter that he had in the early days where he walked with his Lord. John Stott wrote his commentary on the letters of John in 1964, but listen to the way he describes his context and how it could be speaking to us today. This is John Stott. The middle and end of the 20th century are an epoch of fundamental insecurity. Everything is changing, nothing is stable. New nations have constantly been coming to birth. New social and political patterns are continually evolving. The very su survival of civilization is in doubt before the threat of nuclear war. These, ex these external insecurities are reflected in the world of the mind and of the spirit. Even the Christian church, which has received a kingdom that cannot be shaken and discharged to proclaim him who is the same yesterday, today and forever, now often speaks its message softly, shyly and without conviction. There is a widespread distrust of dogmatism and a preference for agnosticism or free thought. Many church members are filled with uncertainty and confusion. Could be writing today. The letters of John are a contrast to this, John Stott says. He says they're full of assurance, knowledge, confidence, and boldness. Certainty is a key theme in the letters of John. The word ginoskine, to know, to perceive, comes 25 times in the letters. The word parisia, confidence or boldness, comes four times in 1 John alone. I think John's letters are a reminder to us in the Diocese of Leicester in 2017, as they were in AD 90 and as they were in 1964, that there is a gospel truth of which we can be sure and certain and in which we can have confidence. That truth is found in the person and the nature and the saving acts of Jesus Christ, based on the witness of the apostles and recorded in scripture. Truth is not a very trendy concept at the moment. Truth is a relative concept in our world. Ever since the Manic Street Preacher's album, This Is My Truth, Tell Me Yours. Actually, before that, I think Nietzsche and Derrida probably had a bit more to do with it than the Manic Street Preachers, but there we go. I think John would say to us, sisters and brothers, it is possible to be certain of something. 
there is truth, and that truth came in the flesh and died for our sins. Of this we can be confident. But alongside that certainty, we certainly have big questions to ask ourselves as a church. How do we know what is truth? How do we decide where truth ends and error or false teaching begins? What are the boundaries to truth? How do we share that truth with others in presence and in proclamation? And tomorrow we're going to explore a little further what it means to live with that tension of truth and love. We're challenged by John's letters to holy living. As a church, we're to keep the commandments. All who obey his commandments abide in him, John says, and he abides in them. The call to Christ, to follow Christ, is the call to live differently. It was then and it is now. There's no place for sin, John would say. The church has been known for speaking about sin a lot and of love not enough. But John's first letter reminds us that there is no conflict between the call to repentance and the call to love. Tom Wright, again, puts it like this. Sinners need to know that Jesus has died for them and that they can be fully and freely forgiven. Forgiven sinners need to know that this is not a reason to go on sinning. Both are true and at, uh, both are at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. As the church grapples with issues of human sexuality, interfaith relations, diversity, justice, and what it means to welcome and accept everyone, and also to live in accordance with God's commandments, I think John's letters speak to us very clearly of the need for Jesus' followers to be both people of radical Christian welcome and inclusion, and people of the truth who call all to repentance from all sin, including and most especially ourselves. And the main sign of this should not be harsh legalism, but love. Keep the old commandments, says John, but there's a new one. Whoever loves lives in the light. So we know and we live and we love. What that means for us as a church will continue to explore over the next few days. Now, doing a Bible study on a whole book, especially one like 1 John, is difficult at the best of times, and so I'd like us to try something. All I've been able to do just now is to int introduce you to some of the key themes of John. Um, and it's really difficult with John because it's not organized in nice linear patterns. You're not able to say 1 John is A plus B equals C. It's repetitive and it spirals back and forth amongst the same topics. Tom Wright says it's more like A plus B equals C with a little bit of D, and C and D equals Z e and F. Oh, and now back to A. It's a real nightmare for someone who, likes, like me, loves order. The three-point sermon is my natural stomping ground. But John's sermon is a bit more like a nine-point sermon with several subsections and U-turns and rabbit runs in the bargain. Tom Wright says it's a, bit like one of a, it's a bit like a very repetitive modern chorus that goes back several times to the same word or phrase and then has a random bridge thrown in for good measure. <laughs> he says we're probably not meant to analyse the structure, but to appreciate it and to let its meaning sink in. So that's what we're going to do together now. We've got about half an hour and on each of your tables is the whole of one John, or in the room all together is the whole of one John. So each table has got two bits of one John, and together we have the whole thing. So if you'd like to find those bits of paper. And what I invite you to do is to simply appreciate the meaning of this portion that you've been given for your context. So my suggestion, and we'll see, this could work or it could be disastrous, but never mind, we'll have fun trying, uh, is that you answer this question. If John was writing this portion that I have on this piece of paper to my context, what would he be saying? Who would he be speaking to? What would his concern be? How would he want me to live out that balance of knowing, living, and loving? Now, 
if you want to write something uh, deep and profound and long, you can do, uh, but we've only got half an hour. If you just want to write a few words, that's fine. If you want to write it a bit like a lyric of a song, we've just been talking about music and about how this is a little bit like a chorus. If you want to write the line of a chorus that reflects this passage for your context, do that. If you just want to write some names, that's fine. If you just want to write the name of your parish, there, there are no sort of hard and fast rules here. But what I would love us to do at the end, uh, we'll hear a little bit of feedback, and then I'd like us to, and we've got some masking tape, stick all of them, and you've got numbers on the back to help you to do this, in order along that wall there. A friend of mine who's an artist once cut up the Bible. He, he got a Bible and he took all the pages out and pasted the whole of the Bible on a wall. And it was amazing to see the whole of the Bible written on a wall. Well, we, we're not going to do that with the whole of the Bible, but we will do it with 1 John. So on one side of the paper will be 1 John, and on the other side will be the Diocese of Leicester. It'll be your context. It'll be what God is saying to you through this passage of Scripture. I apologise in advance to those of you who've got the verses about antichrists. Make the best of it. I'm sure there's something that could come out of it. Uh, some of you will have easier section than others. But interpret it for, for what God is saying to you about this passage of Scripture. We'll, we'll do this together for 10 minutes or so. We'll hear a little bit of feedback, and then we'll, in a kind of visual way, paste them all up on the wall, and then we'll go and have tea. How does that sound? Take a few moments to do this together. Just to clarify, uh, write your bit, the thing you want to say, on the back. Okay, so you've got the verse on one side, you write your bit on the other side. Or your words, or whatever comes to mind. You've got two per table. You could either both do all of them or do one half, one piece, the other half of the table, the other piece.
Okay, folks, how are you doing? Are you coping with the purple lights? It looks a little bit like Strictly Come Dancing from here, only without the dancing. Um, to turn to a, a different programme altogether, uh, Barry from Sileby has chosen Machine Arthur for us tonight. Uh, that is, we have a, a little bingo machine here with the number of every table in it, and we're going to turn the handle, and a number is going to come out. Uh, I'll let you know which number it is, and then uh, your table and Emma can have a bit of dialogue uh, following your discussion. Are you going to do that? We were fighting over who was going to turn the handle, but Tim won. 17. Ta table 17. We're, just to invite, if Table 17 doesn't want to comment, don't worry about it, but we'll, we'll spin again. But if somebody on Table 17 would like where to... Is where is Table 17? Wave at us, Table 17. Yay, over there. If there's anything you'd like to share from what you've been saying or telling us about how that roots in your context, uh, if not, we can pass the mic microphone on. I have to be careful because my TI is in the room. So I have to... I have to be a good boy. Um, we've got the um, uh, beloved do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Mm, for good. many false prophets have gone out into the world. Um, I've not been in the benefits long. So I have to be careful. I, 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 this screamed out church unity. We have two different churches, mm. two different styles, two different backgrounds. And one thing I've probably picked up is there's a wariness of each other. One very charismatic, evangelical, the other one very traditional mm. with prayer book. And I think there's um, there's something about it that's saying that we do it the right way. And mm, that's thank what you. come out to me at that one. Thank you. So that, that, that call to test everything, uh, but to do it in love, is a, is a key thing for your context. Thank you for that. Oh, are we glamorous assistant. Yes, you, please. Uh, thank you, glamorous assistant. I'm doing this very well. It's not coming out. <laughs> oh, there we are, there we are. Excellent. The tension. What have we got? 20. We've got table 20. Table 20, is there anything you... Please feel free not to feel press-ganged into sharing something just because this has come out, but if you'd like to. I think Barry's, uh, <laughs> Barry's heading towards you. We have had uh, John, 1 John 3, 4 to 6. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sin, and in him there is no sin. Mm. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Our thinking went uh, into the direction of... Um, it being present tense, in that very moment, as we sin, we behave as if we, as if we had not known him. Also, uh, I added that, we didn't discuss it so much, uh, the principle of growth, in terms of the more clearly you see Christ, the less you will sin. The better mm. you know him, the less you will sin. Mm. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Some profound thoughts. I, I've got a short straw with... Got the short straw with uh, verse 22. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we didn't really manage to do much on verse 22, That's all right, but it looks not dissimilar to um, to the the previous verse. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Mm. Everyone who commits sin is a child of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. And I just follow on from that, I think it's, it's again living in that and, isn't it? Um, we, we do. I mean, I, not one of us here, I trust, apart from the bishop, of course, um, is sinless. Um, <laughs> I think the bishop might have something um, to say about that. Uh, so we're all, in that regard, at a given time, mm. according to this letter, children of the devil. But the, the, the thing is to be more children of Christ and try harder mm. to be more children of Christ. 
uh, we came up with a metaphor with David's help, um, which was how we are when we're in the car sometimes, and I'll leave it at that. Yeah, very good. It's interesting, isn't it? There's a lot of talk about sin in 1 John. Um, sometimes when he talks about sin, he uses a word that's more like rebellion. So rather, we were saying this on our table, rather than just one-off bad things or, you know, especially whilst driving, not being very Christian, um, it's more about direction of travel and being constantly rebellious um, against God. That's one of the ways that John understands sin. So thank you. Wow, we're getting quite theological down here. Shall we we have one more table? I thought we were getting music as well, weren't we? What have we got? Drum roll number nine. Where's table nine? (laughs) Table nine is down here. Anything you'd like to say from your context, maybe? How does this root itself in uh, where you are on the ground? Uh, I'm just trying to find the time. End times. Okay. End times. Great. End times. Just what we need. (laughs) Uh, Chapter 2, verse 18. Children, it is the last hour. As you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Oh, good luck. (laughs) We actually spent less on this than some other topics, but this is the uh, less contentious one between us. So um, I think we just reflected on um, that in every era, there's a sense of anxiety and concern Mm. about some of the forces of destruction that we see at work. Mm. You know, so in today's world, we see Donald Trump becoming president of America um, Mm. and everything else that goes on, which is really quite disturbing. And then I suppose we think back that 60, 70 years ago, there was the forces of Nazism Mm. at work. And 100 years ago, Mm. there were forces which allowed millions of men to die in trenches. Mm. Um, And it goes all the way back. So it's something about on this journey of faith and this journey of living with truth um, and holding on to truth, but sometimes truth gets challenged as things changes, that, that wherever the church has existed, right back to uh, the first Johannine community, mm. there's always been this sense of some of the, the, the big destructive forces mm. make us anxious and looking for, is this about to come to an end? Is a new thing of God going to erupt into our lives? Excellent. That's really interesting. And yet John speaks into that, doesn't he, with a, with a call to, to live well, to love each other and to be confident. You know, I love that call that you're right in whatever age the uncertainty comes, we can be confident in the truth of, of the gospel and, uh, and speak into that. So thank you. That's great. Let's have one more comment and then we're going to make our line. So the last lucky table is number 19, table 19. Show yourself, table 19, just over there. <laughs> Anything you'd like to say? Don't worry if not. You can pass it on to another one. We had two lots. So this was the one we spoke the most about, which was uh, chapter 5. And his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world? but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Yay, a nice verse. <laughs> yeah, <Ooh>. wonderful. <laughs> Very encouraging verse. Well, yes and no. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, we've written down here, well, Clive's written for us, we have got conquering the world wrong. It is, oh dear. Accomplished. Accomplished through Christ. Mm-hmm. We think we need lots of resources, but we have the one resource we need, Jesus mm. Christ. Mm. And in the midst of things that are burdensome, it is reassuring to know that God's commandments are not burdensome. Mm, Thank you. That's very good. So it's Christ that conquers, and that's the resource that we need. Very encouraging. Thank you. Thank you. I think we probably need to draw the time to a close and go and have a cup of tea, but thank you for all the conversations that you've had on your table. Can I just encourage you? I ought to give these back, otherwise it's all going to go wrong later on down the line. That... um, If you haven't written anything on your paper, just write something. Just write the the context, the parishes that you're in or the situation you're in so that we can, as it were, hold them and see them as we do our line together. So in a moment, I'm going to pray for us. And then can I encourage you to take your papers, and this will be an exercise in itself, to line them up in order 
So they are numbered on the back, 1 to 48. There are 24 tables. There are two on each table, so 1 to 48. And uh, either just give them to, to someone, um, but we'll stick them all along there so we can see them all together and uh, take a chance during these few days to look at what people have written. But shall I pray for us as we go and have some tea together? Loving God, we thank you for that assurance that it is you who conquers. We thank you that through the ages, Jesus, you have been the one in whom your church puts its confidence. We thank you for the truth of your gospel. We thank you for the call to live in the light. And we thank you that you ask us to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray that you would help us to do all of those things over these next few days together. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen.